He's in tree. You in tree? Oh, tree? whichever. I don't think we delineate. It's just whoever starts talking first and says the funniest thing. Well, that's never me, is it? Sometimes. <laughs> that's if it doesn't get edited out. No, I leave all your best bits in. That's why it's a 20-minute show. Welcome to Making Tracks. Because of the following special program, Wonder Woman and the Incredible Hulk will not be presented this evening. <laughs> It's time to get all your Star Wars news in a single file. That doesn't sound too hard. Boom! This is Making Tracks. This is the way. Here are your hosts, Mark Newbold and Mark Mocast. Oh, I know these people, they are brutal. Does this look Jedi to you? That's not how the Force works. They'll never see it coming. Count me in. How are you, Mr. Newbold? How's things on your side of the world? Things on my side of the world are very, very good, thank you very much. It's a normal Star Wars week, which means there's loads of it. Uh, it's stuff to read, <laughs> stuff to buy, and stuff to, to lust after that I can't afford. Have you been buying anything, or have you just been lusting after things? I'm always lusting after something, but the things I have bought this week have been very, very boring. Nothing that would light your world. I've bought some new bags and boards for my comics, yep. and God, they cost a lot of money these days. Yep. And I've also ordered some more of the... Because I've got vintage figures uh, loose, but kept the car backs for most of them. So I've been buying the classic boxes from Defector DC that you can sort of pop into shape for the boxes, and then mounting them on the card back covers that you can get. You can get yep. three or four card backs in if you've got that many per figure. So I've been doing that. I've just been putting those together. And then I bought something from a company called ghoststands.com, which if you've got the little die cast land speeders or x wings or stuff from back in the day, they did yeah. a stand for the land speeder, which is uh-huh. basically a little bit of sort of plastic, see-through plastic, that you fold out into like an L shape, and the two little struts sit under the back wheels, and the other strut sits under the, one of the front wheels, and basically, if you position the land speeder correctly, it looks like it's hovering. And it's uh-huh. really, really cool, and they've now done stands for, uh, I think that it's imminently coming out for the cloud car, uh, yeah. They also do stands for your uh, Palator speeder bike and land speeder and stuff like that. So they're really getting into making nice. these invisible yeah. hovering stands. And I think the way it's going, the way it looks, you know, it could build into a lot of your fleet, whatever sort of ships you have, could appear to be hovering. The cool thing about it is the packaging is really, really nice. Just the packaging it comes in, it's just caught my eye. So I'm kind of uh, I'm kind of into getting more of these. I've just ordered the, the Twin Park Cloud Car stand. And yeah, they're really nice. But apart from that, I'm looking yeah. around... And no, I've got nothing else this week. What about you? So I just happened to pick up my first 2025 calendar, Mandalorian one. Happened to be passing a stand of uh, calendars in the range. And I was like, I might as well get one now. But I mean, it's only five ninety nine anyway. You know, it's a yeah. typical generic sized one. So that's cool. That needs to kind of find a home. I'll tell you one thing I don't have. And it is much to my chagrin and dismay. I don't actually own any of the vintage die cast vehicles. Really? Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's kind of like one of those things that I see at loads of fairs and stuff. I'm like, I must pick those up one of these days. Yeah. But I just haven't. In fact, I've got the First Order Speeder from Force Awakens. Funnily enough, comes on a little kind of clear plastic plinthy thing. So it kind of does the same kind of thing. But I've never been bothered to go back and pick up the vintage ones. So It's maybe... weird. I, I've got That's some... Cool. Yeah, you should, because I've got some and they're like really, I mean, they're rough as anything. They've looked like they've been kicked around the back garden. They're not pretty at all. Yeah. And I know there's certain collectors who get them boxed and packaged and on the bubble and they're mega mm. expensive. Yeah. I'd love to have the Falcon on the bubble, but it's silly money. But I've got a Falcon, but it is much loved. It's probably the phrase I would use. Yes. Uh, all, the, all the paints off all the corners. I mean, I've sort of got them over the years from different people. One came from a kid I knew at school. I've had it that many years. Right, yeah, The yeah. other came from a, a girl I was friends with years ago, and it was her brother's, and she went, do you want this? And it was it was the land speeder, actually, oh, that nice. I just mentioned. And then the X-Wing, but the X-Wing's wings have come off, so they yes. sort of sit next to the, next to the X-Wing. Uh, and there's a couple of bits I still need. I've got a really battered slave one. I do need the Thai bomber. So there's a couple of bits that I still need. But over the years, there's other uh, metal stuff. Mattel have done their Hot Wheels vehicles and cars. Yes. Hasbro did a black series of ships as well. It's about did, 35 ships. Yeah. Really, no, not to scale, but they're beautiful. I've got four or five Rawcliffe ones from the mid-90s. Slave One, X-Wing, Snowspeeder, and the Outrider. Oh, and, nice. And Because I've got probably about 10 or so of the actual pewter figures. 
again like mid 90s so it was something that was kind yeah. of in and around my wheelhouse at the time when i had was kind of really kind of collecting stuff probably on the back of like an insider magazine or something the falcon is fairly expensive one i think it's bigger and i think it tends to come on a plinth as well so it takes right. a bit more space but the others again they're on their own plinths so they're cast onto them which is a little bit annoying but they are nice some of them have like gold accents and stuff which is quite cool i might have to tap up my good friend mr phil parker because he's quite the um the wizard when it comes to vintage collection stuff these days so he is he'll, he'll um yeah he'll definitely be able to point me in some directions to get some die cast on it and uh, might be a good 2025 project hi this is kevin cornwall and you're listening to fan for tracks Okay, we've not heard much news from the new Jedi Order film, the Daisy Ridley Ray 15 Years On project, but there was some news this week. In fact, there was quite a bit of news. First things first, Stephen Knight, he of Peaky Blinders, has left the project, moved on to Pastures New. It seems like there's a lot of stuff happening with the Peaky Blinders movie, which is coming to Netflix, and he's focusing his attentions elsewhere. That means he is now no longer involved in the Ray film. And about two days later, as we posted on Fantha, Daisy Ridley was speaking to Josh Horowitz on the Happy Sad Confused podcast. And in that conversation, which was talking about her new film Magpie, Josh brought the subject of Star Wars up, as he always does. And she did mention that, without saying too much, there's going to be something announced fairly soon. And as she said it, she had a very big happy smile on her face. So a writer leaving a project, especially a Star Wars project, it's always going to get news. It's always going to get attention. But it's not like Michael Arndt didn't leave Force Awakens or Gary Witter didn't leave Rogue One. Writers certainly take things to a point and then they move on. But when you get a writer of the calibre of Stephen Knight coming on board a project, especially now a lot of people are expecting the Ray film to have probably started filming this year, if not this year, the next year, with a 2026 projected date coming after the Mando and Grogu film in May of 26, May 22nd, 26. Where do you think this leaves us with this project? Do you think it's it's obviously newsworthy, but do you think it's a big deal? Do you think it's a worry? Do you think it's kind of business as usual for Hollywood productions? Where do you think this sits? Oh, difficult one. I'm not worried about it, but then it all depends what comes out from it, i.e., is it because, as you said, he's gone back to work on, say, the uh, Peaky Blinders film, and this was a scheduling clash. Like, I can work on this up until a point, but then I need to hop back onto this other thing that I might have a little bit more kind of like allegiance to or what have you you know sometimes it it can just be part of a course can't it with like you said with hollywood films and sometimes a writer gets so far they take it so far and even like i said they, they move on because of other projects have got lined up or just because they're like right okay let's have a fresh approach a fresh uh spin because that's the thing if if you're writing something and if you're champion maybe a, a story b or something and it's not necessarily working sometimes a fresh approach is what's needed like gary witter he wrote a lot of rogue one but then you write to a point and then you pass it on and then you let somebody else do the polish it could just be the natural evolution of this production so of all the things to be worried about for this production I, i'm not worried about that really if i'm, if I'm honest daisy was announced at celebration last year which was what was that april last year yeah so yeah, yeah. We've, mm-hmm. we've known she's coming back for like 18 months and she's been saying since then, I've seen bits, I've seen this, I've seen that. And obviously we know she probably hasn't seen a full script because a full script seemingly doesn't exist. And that's OK. I think for me, I just want the best film to come out the back of it. So if this gets yeah. pushed back to 2027, it's not going to have an effect on the Mando and Grogu film because nope. that's set 30 plus years before this. So chronologically, they're not going to touch on each other. There's not going to be nope. an issue. Same with the Mangold film. Apparently, it's out there that he's saying that that will be filming next year, 2025. But that's set thousands of years before. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So that's not going to have an effect. Unless it's there's a book that Ray picks up in the Jedi archives that you see in the Dawn of the Jedi film. I don't know. Easter egg stuff, not yeah. massive thematic stuff. I'm more concerned personally about it just being as good as it can be, mostly because we've waited so long. So for me, yeah, it's a shame if Stephen Knight's moved off. But then again, when you get to the end of it and it's all come together and everything gets put you know, into place, who knows? Stephen Knight might have come up with the mega twist for this yeah. film. He might have come up with the idea of, I don't know, the Rogue One idea of Galen Erso leaving the fuse inside the Death Star, Jin to find and Luke to blow up, you know, that kind of logic. Obvious when you think about it, but in the story writing, it was so well laid out. It felt like a, like a genius. Wow, what a great idea. And maybe Stephen Knight's given something like that, or, or maybe a lot more, I don't know. This is high-level speculation when you think about it. This, we're not seeing behind the doors of uh, Lucasfilm and the production, so... 
we can only guess. And I'm sure there's probably only two or three people who really know the true story of what's going on. I guess you just got to take it with a pinch of salt. And when the film does come out, you just got to take it for what it is rather than what it isn't. Unless, of course, actually there is something in The Mandalorian and Grogu that they've just kind of gone, do you know what, actually... We can use this. Let's somehow try and fit this into Star Wars 10, if we're going to call it that, or, you know, New Jedi Order, whatever, what Ray does next. Then there's that slight continuity between the two eras, but it might just be something that now needs to be worked on in a way where you've got to go back to maybe square one or stage two or something off a script. So it doesn't just feel like it's just been retroactively added in just because it's cool in, you know, Mandalorian and Grogu. One of these days, it'd be nice if Disney and Lucasfilm started to have the balls again to um, produce making of books for these films. There's definitely some fascinating stories that have not been told publicly that I'd love to find out about. And the development of these scripts, especially, say, like Force Awakens and all that, is definitely one of them. Absolutely. But with Daisy being so vocal and so often saying, there's news imminent, I've seen... Yeah. I've kind of seen the thumbnail sketch of where we're going Things to go. Things are moving in a, in a positive direction. It's, it's, we're not talking Ryan Johnson kind of like, oh, yeah, I'm still kind of working on ideas and stuff. It sounds like the fact that she's involved and she's seeing stuff means that they, they, they must be progressing. Otherwise, why would she bother saying it? You'd, you'd almost think at that point she'd be like trying to maybe distance herself from it a little bit so it doesn't, you know, if it does blow up, it doesn't blow up necessarily in her face as well. She's there front and centre saying, things are happening, don't worry, things are happening, I'm seeing stuff. If they haven't got stuff in place, if there isn't something happening, if she hasn't seen anything, why would they hang her out to dry if they ever wanted to use her in the future? You know, there's got to be something that she's hanging her hat on and Lucasfilm as a whole and Disney and everybody else to look forward to. So that, I think, going back to the point of people making a lot of Stephen Knight leaving, it does feel like for a big production, especially like a like mega big production like Star Wars, that that yeah. is kind of business as usual. and. We now wait and see what Daisy's imminent announcement will be because she was beaming when she was saying it. Yeah. And clearly she's buzzing about Star Wars. It also comes within a week or so of John Boyega being at New York Comic Con. And he was very happily and very vocally saying how great it was to reconnect with the Star Wars fans. Yeah. He was very clear to make that point. And, you know, he's been in quite a few things. He's won awards. He's done a lot of stuff since uh, Rise of Skywalker, but wanted to make that point that it was great to reconnect with Star Wars. So maybe. Maybe this is all sort of coalescing into, you know, some sort this of announcement. A, yeah, do, do you think it's a reunion, man? Maybe. I mean, we're past right. all the big conventions. New York Comic Con's the last real big convention of yeah. the year. So we don't really get much now conventions-wise until Easter time. Maybe that big announcement is Daisy and John are both going to be at Celebration. Who knows? Exactly. Who knows? But watch your space and watch fan for tracks for all the latest news when it hits. Well done. It's always like a rehearsed it. Hi, I'm Duncan Poe, and you're listening to fan for tracks so a couple of weeks ago, Panther Tracks were at Fan X Live down at Farnborough. We had a fantastic weekend, brilliant show with loads of great guests, including Brian Herring and Lee Towsley. Lee was there with his badly bashed up thumb, and Brian was there being Brian. And I had the chance to speak to the two of them together at the end of the day on the Sunday. So this is myself, Brian Herring, and Lee Towsley at Fan X Live in Farnborough. We're here in Farnborough at Fan X in a lovely convention centre on a Sunday afternoon. I'm with Lee and I'm with Brian. How are you doing, guys? Hello there. Hello. <laughs> How's the day going? It's Sunday. Sunday's traditionally quieter, but it seems fairly busy at the moment. So how's it all going? There's lots of lovely people, and I've had a lot of lovely chats. Yeah, it's, it's getting busier as well, and um, yeah, it's, it's a good event. And met some lovely people. Yeah, yeah that's good. It's a nice venue, actually. It is a nice venue. It is a nice it's venue, good. and I didn't realise until somebody pointed out that that's all tarped off. So oh, yeah, 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 it's big. Yeah, it's, exactly. it's a big thing. Yeah. I mean, there was Screwfix Live was here two weeks ago. I wish I'd been here for that. Wow. Yeah, I know, Screwfix Live. I don't Live. reckon people would want your autograph at Screwfix No, I don't think Live. they probably would, but just, I, don't think um, that would I, I, would, I would like to have just, just been here for the Power Tools panel. <laughs> <laughs> your line of work, I suppose, is quite useful, isn't it? Ladies and gentlemen, Mr. Juson. <laughs> Good point. <laughs> now, I, I, can't, I can't not address the hand. Yeah. Not talk to the hand, but address that hand. Yeah. What happened there? Um, it had an argument with a angle grinder, and sadly I cut my tendon in my thumb. Ow. And it's put me out of work for a considerable amount of time. Luckily the job was coming to an end anyway, but um, yeah, self-inflicted injury, completely my fault. And uh, at Pinewood Studios, and that's all I can tell you about it. And you did mention, <laughs> you described to me quite vis visually what a, a tendon that's uh, disattached is like. 
yes, um, anyone that's a bit squeamish, it's it's a, like two bits of wet spaghetti apparently that they've stitched together, and we have to wait for it to, uh, wait for it to repair. And if I overdo the physio, it can snap again, and I oh. and I can go through the operation again. No, thank you very much because okay. I'm I'm a big wuss, right. so uh, I don't want to go through that again. So no more seven hours in a and no more. No, thank you. No, thank you. Good grief. Can no. you still drive your droids? Not at the moment. No. I'm in, a, I'm in a splint for two more weeks. I'm not allowed to drive anything. Right. Which is why I had to get the train here today. That, that, was, that was fun. Luckily, it's not my signing hand, so I can still sign. Oh, OK. If anybody was, want, was to want my signature today. Yeah, of course. Um, I can sign. Helen did suggest that I might be a has-been now. So she was concerned that I might not be signing anything. Well, I think um, has, it has been suggested that you were, 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 once, were, were once a bean, wasn't it? <laughs> <laughs> but how many autographs do I have to sign to not be a has-been? I don't know. Is that the question? I don't many, know. And how many beans make I, five? I, I, well, <laughs> we'll see. But uh, yeah, at least I'm up to—I'm not up to double digits yet. But I have got a oh, number yeah, of signatures. Right. So, you were nearly uh, down a digit there. So, so. Uh, yeah, very good. <laughs> <laughs> Any injuries you want to talk about, Brian? Not that I can talk about. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> so what's this new? is top quality content, this isn't it? Isn't it? Isn't it? <laughs> Thank goodness oh. <laughs> it's all your Star Wars news in a single file, isn't it? Well, exactly, <laughs> exactly. So speaking of which, what, what's new with everybody? What are you into? What's the latest thing that's lighting you? What's the latest latest thing? Well, um, I, I think I was happened to be involved in what is currently the uh, number one box office for movie in the world, which True. is Beetlejuice. No, Beetlejuice. I think it's still number one. It could, it could have been knocked off. Don't worry about the interview. You just come oh, up. Just it. It's absolutely <laughs> fine. Uh, Mr. Julian Owen, ladies and gentlemen. Um, Special guest. Uh, yeah. Yes. Happy uh, briefly appearing. You can edit that out, can't you? Um, nah. I've been involved in uh, Beetlejuice, Beetlejuice, which yes. we're all very extremely proud of. And um, we, we, we made it last year. Uh, it was a very quick shoot, and we all had an absolute blast. And what's really lovely is that everything we did is in the movie. Yeah. Um, and it all looks beautiful, and it's a huge amount of fun. And if you haven't been, go now. It's and it's an hour and forty-five minutes door to door. It's good. It tells its story, and it goes away. Really it's good great fun. fun. Really yeah, it's great fun. It's interesting you say that everything you did went in the movie. That's mega rare. Isn't it, it is very, very rare, and it's. Um, it was all. You know, Tim Burton is is obviously quite a you know quite a, a very specific type of filmmaker. And everything's done in his style, but uh, with, we have gone with Neil Scanlon again, yeah. and uh, it's the third film Neil's done with Tim, and there's a, there's a level of trust there that you know Neil just trusts. Sorry, uh, Tim just trusts Neil to deliver, yeah. and Neil delivers. Yeah. You know, he, he has people here around him. He always employs a crew that he knows can do it, and um, Tim just trusted us to, to come to you know, come to set with stuff that he knew would work. Yeah. And we had a we had an absolute blast. You know, yeah. there was all kinds of crazy. And stuff everything going. you see is practical. Yeah. You know, with yeah. CG enhancement, obviously, because yep. yep. some people some of the things you couldn't actually do. Yep. But even that was, did have ele- elements of practicality in it, didn't it? Yeah. I mean, it's, they, I mean, there's stuff there where they've removed four puppeteers. Yeah, yeah. You know, we're all on the rods again doing our thing, and uh, they just and it's all the old. You know, a lot of the people that yeah. a lot of the names that people would have seen on the Star Wars credits, and it's the same team. Um, um, yeah. We just had an absolute blast. We, we did laugh a lot. It was nice to see Neil's names pretty high up in the credits. Yeah, he was. He, right he's, yeah, he's, 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 he's. Uh, Above the line on it, so yeah. uh, I think everyone was quite pleased. Him and Angus Bickerton, uh, no, I mean, Angus, Angus and Neil go back years and years. Uh, it's back to Henson's. Yeah, yeah. So I think Angus did. I think he did Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy, which was one of the first times I met him. Uh, and he, so he's a visual effects supervisor on it. And they they know it. They they, they kind of know each other very well. And that. And as Neil has said it previously with Roger Geyer, you know, it's like we have a thing and we've got to get rid of these guys. And then so Angus will come in and just go right, we'll get rid of the lads and keep yeah. the puppets. So that's uh, yeah. That, that, that it's, it was really really nice to see his name go up. And it's and it, it's a real feather in his cap because it's proper old school filmmaking yeah, yeah. with new technology involved and I think that's when, when that marriage comes in and works well that's that's when it's at its absolute best that was the thing as an observer it looked so much like the first film I yeah. know that was the intent so yep. they nailed that brief there's a, there's a little level of shonkiness about the whole thing yeah. which is what makes it fun? Yeah, yeah. You know, it's it's not slick. Yeah. And um, you know, Tim kept saying this isn't gonna this isn't gonna win any Oscars. 
Although it would be absolutely fantastic if it got nominated, yeah. you know, because yeah. it's, no, it's, it's, it's a hoot. That it's sandworm's just... not going to turn up on Arrakis, is it? it no, but it's but it's but it was but it was but it was it was all old school yeah. um, uh, stop motion animation, you know. And um, is it McKinnon and Saunders did the? There's a sequence at the beginning which explains why oh, yeah. the, Jeffrey. why Jeffrey Jones is yeah. in the yeah. movie, yeah. and that was all done. In fact, I, I, I'm given to believe they kept sending that back to say it looks too good. Yeah, yeah can you make it look a little more old? School? Yeah, and uh, it's, yeah, it's great. It's a huge amount of fun. If you haven't been yet, you do go. It's great. You've obviously had to pull out of the remake of Thumbelina, but what are you? Doing? Uh, <laughs> <laughs> God, there you go. Five minutes to think of. Yeah, you yeah, did. Well yeah, yeah. Well, you get a long time to think when Brian's talking. Um, <laughs> so yeah, I'm, I'm lo- looking forward, and to get back on track, I will say I'm looking forward to Star Wars next year. I haven't done any Star Wars for the last year. We've yeah. been busy doing Big the Juice and various other projects with Neil. You know, it's been nice that I've been employed for so long, um, but we're all looking forward to getting back into Star Wars now. I think so. Let's hope, you know, when Andor 2 comes out, which we're all very proud of, let's hope that's okay, you know, I'm I'm sure that'll be fine, which we finished last year, Um, and then get on to new projects next year, Lucasfilm related. When you get to do something that isn't Star Wars, because obviously you're known for Star Wars, that's how you came into the when you do something that's not Star Wars, is it almost like a a, a palette refresher, if that makes sense, that you look at things in a different way? Definitely, yeah, and it gives me an opportunity to learn other skills as well, so I'm, I'm more helping people out than building on my own projects yeah, yeah. so I get to learn more skills around the workshop and, and get involved in you other projects that. I love it I love it still happy to learn and you know learn how to use a laser cutter and CNC machines and, yeah. and all that and it, then that skill can go on to helping me when I'm doing my own projects on Star Wars yeah. so yeah you need to learn how to use an angle grinder as well yeah, well yeah I, yeah I do need to get back on the bike as they say and do need to use it you can't again. get on the bike at but uh, I can't get on the bike at the moment you're not leaving it alone are you no. you're just, like, just going to you really I need it it's pink one. and green I can't not see it can I <laughs> that, I would like to say that's the dressing that's pink and green it's not your stuff. not thumb. my thumb yeah. that's, true. Yeah. that's true well thank you very much for your time gentlemen always a pleasure Mr. pleasure Mark. good to see you as always Mark cheers Mark for everything in one location daily news reviews interviews podcasts video and social media feeds bookmark Fanthatracks.com for Star Wars News 24-7, 365. There may be conversations about the fate of the Ray film, but at the moment there doesn't seem to be many conversations about the fate of the Mando and Grogu film because principal photography has apparently been completed. All the work has gone ahead in the volume. Certainly there will be pickups and additional shoots and ILM can now get started and Pedro Pascal can add his voice to the character and all the other things that will happen but as it stands Mando and Grogu coming out 22nd of May 2026 is essentially in the cat now as it stands given that we don't know what really is going on above and beyond what we know about Mando and Grogu and other little snippets here and there this is good concrete solid news it's a very positive progression isn't it yeah it's nice to hear that actually Star Wars is being made <laughs> but also not been much publicity about it, is it? It's, you know, no. We're in a different, slightly different era. I mean, I can just remember when the internet broke for that one day when JJ posted that first photo from on set of Force Awakens, right? You yeah. know, just that Starting one. It. I was a slate, wasn't it? Just a couple. Yeah. Of, those were the days when everybody's hungry for Star Wars. Hopefully, the, the negative comments aren't you know front and center. So yeah, it's good news. It means they've, they've obviously got a lot of uh, VFX and post work ahead of them but it's looking promising for the release date given what you've just said and i totally agree do you think that outside of those clips that we saw a few months ago the scene with the at at and and stuff like that those those visual effect shots the ilm apparently have got ahead of the game and they've started early on on this project because it's filmed in a volume yeah because it's a bit like the george thing the grady ranch thing the volume that he wanted to do back in the day whereby so it was Underworld, you know, you make all the costumes, you get all the cast, you stick them in that volume and you make the show you want to make. And there's very little promotion until such a point as it's ready to go. And then you promote the absolute crap out of it. And you've got a show that's barely spoiled. You know, I'm guessing, I'm thinking that was probably what George would have wanted as much as he could to have control over even that aspect yeah. of the show. But now you get to Manda and Grogu and it feels like his apprentice if you want to call him that Filoni he's, he's way beyond being an apprentice now of course but you know what I'm saying it, yeah. the, you know spiritually he's George's successor has gone and done something that you imagine George would have wanted to do if he'd have had the the effects that have been where he wanted them to be if the locals had played ball and let him even build the thing now 
Filoni and Favreau, because Favreau's directed it, have managed to corral this team of people together. And it sounds like, you know, uh, Natasha Leone has been mentioned as being involved and Sigourney Weaver has been mentioned. There's big names outside of the, the cast that we know that are apparently yeah. involved in this show. That they've managed to make this thing in isolation and very, very, very little has leaked, if anything, and very little is known because it's a closed set. It feels like a good place to be, doesn't it? It feels like a, a great place to be, actually. It'll be interesting to see how the volume really does translate from the small screen to the big screen, especially if they're hanging the whole production on there. We can understand the flexibility that they've had from it because we, it's been well documented, but there are times when you go, oh, does it feel a bit small? Does it feel a little bit sparse? When you compare a, a, an environment from, say, Mandalorian and then compare it to, say, Andor or the Acolyte even, you know, which are both practical sets heavy, there's still quite a big difference. So I think for me, I'm really curious just to see how they bridge that and, and what improvements have been. Because obviously, you know, the, this is a great thing about the volume is that it's not something that it's just like, okay, great, we've got this thing now. We're just going to just use it. You know, they're, they're constantly trying to improve it, improve the versatility. It's not a static thing. Yeah. No, it's not like just like, oh, okay, great. So we've got a green screen. We can put a green screen up and just you stand there and just do it. You know, there's, there's so many different permutations and improvements they can make with it. Obviously, the size, you know, and what they can do. Have they built a, a big volume or are they using better technology for the actual displays, you know, so that actually you can get higher dynamic range out of the, the panels and they can be brighter and, and therefore feel more like a natural environment rather than a bank of TV screens. So there's a number of different things that they could be improving on it. I think back to 2003, Hyperspace, when they gave us the behind the scenes on Revenge of the Sith, when you could watch them making that film and they weren't showing anything, they weren't giving the farm away. A corner of a like a soundstage on a really, really grainy webcam. Yeah. Exactly that. And occasionally a quarren will walk past. But Paul Bateman was seen in one shot and he spotted himself on Hyperspace. You know, and you'd see Haven walk past occasionally or you'd see George occasionally. And it was all behind a paywall. But nevertheless, the access was there if you really, really wanted it. I don't foresee those days coming back again. And quite to the contrary, actually. I don't know if yeah. I'd want those days to come no. back. I'd, I'd certainly want to see them in what you just said, in behind-the-scenes books and, and ancillary material like that. I want to see more of that on Disney+, Plus, more behind-the-scenes mm -hmm. stuff. That's where you show how the sausage is made, not whilst you're making the sausage. Now you've got them in a volume, the cast, crew, control over your location as much as you can. We talk about this a lot on the show, and we watch a lot of stuff. And yeah. we, we'd like to think we've got a fairly well-trained eye. I couldn't pick out what would be or wouldn't be the stagecraft stuff because I think Good. now yeah. the state, yeah, you know, the stagecraft stuff is as advanced as you've just said, you know, they've got more receptors and projectors and all the other stuff that goes into making these screens more defined, more definition, bigger, you know, physically bigger. So I think now that you've got a room or a location where they can make Something like Mando and Grogu, my very, very long-winded question is, if it doesn't cost the Earth, let's say they've made it pretty much, I don't know, pick a number, 90% in the volume, let's say they've done it in that way, yeah. and they're not going off on location, which is a killer expense, and they've got it in, under control. And let's say they bring this thing in for, I'm picking a number, you know, if a big budget movie now is 220 million, let's say they bring this in for 150, which isn't a killer. If you've got a triple E budget, you're looking at 500 million and anything above that is gravy. And I think they'd be disappointed if they didn't make more than that. They really would. But do you think if this works, if this is a satisfactory box office reception, people get excited again? It is Mando and Grogu after all. So if they yeah. really go for it and this is something that works, do you think this could be maybe not the definitive only future for Star Wars movies, but do you think this could be a really, really healthy avenue to take Absolutely. I think it's a very viable way of doing it as well. And like you said, if they keep the actual production costs down, then yeah, we're in a challenging time when it comes to cinema and franchises. You'd like to hope that the goodwill that the Mandalorian and Grogu have got from the, the last five years or so should mean that you'd at least get a decent box office return for the first couple of weeks, three weeks. I have no idea how far the projections are for box office takings in terms of like for films coming out, what Disney would be expecting from that. I mean, obviously you keep the cost down of production, but obviously it's a smaller risk when it comes to box office. Ultimately, we know where Mando and Grogu will make his money. That will be on the merch. If you think about those first two years since Man Mandalorian came out and like you couldn't even go into like a Primark without tripping over Grogu stuff. It was everywhere. And at the moment, as you, funny enough, I was in there yesterday. Not willingly, I, I might add, but I was in there and yeah, not a sign. And I was like, okay, well, give it another 
year or so and it will be full to the gills again you know there'll be more baby yoda stuff and all that kind of coming back out and and that's probably where they make the money because that's bankable obviously you have a successful movie then it increases that bankability i would think disney have got to be looking at how to keep productions if the cost down across the board but obviously it's a difficult thing with um film and tv you want the cost down you want to do things quicker but you don't want to lose the quality and it's always a very difficult balancing act. So it'll be interesting to see where they find their pivot point. Hi, this is Neil Scanlon, and you're listening to Fanther Tracks. In two days' time, it will be the 31st of October. That is Halloween to most of the world. Whoa. It's also, oh, that was good. It's also Fanther Tracks' seventh birthday. But we have a listener's question, very relevant to the time. It is from Shield Fan 12, with a great name. And Shield Fan 12's question is. If you have to spend one night in a spooky place in the Star Wars universe, where do you choose? Concise, short question. Mark, I'll let you go first. If you could stay in a spooky place in the Star Wars universe, where would you stay? Oh, well, the obvious one is Vader's Castle on Mustafa, but I don't necessarily know if that's spooky. You've got the big man there, and I don't imagine it's filled with people, but it's got to be something more haunted than that. The bowels of a Jedi temple on Coruscant, you know, underground, there was some Sith temple they built over, or even the location where Anakin massacred all those Tusken Raiders in Attack of the Clones. Oh, that's a good answer. I was thinking that the similar lines, I was thinking of after Order 66, when they basically sacked the temple, and yeah. everyone's, you imagine walking around the Jedi temple, which is an enormous place, but walking around the Jedi temple after everyone's been slain, but before they come in and clean up and turn it into like, you know, Imperial Center to walk around there, all the spirits of those dead Jedi. That'd be mega creepy. I was thinking Vader's Castle as well. Some of the Dr. Aphra comics, by their very nature, are quite spooky. Yeah. It's always to do with artifacts that have been imbibed with some kind of like long-lost Sith spirit. So I think you've got to go somewhere quite dark. Can you imagine like walking around like Moraband? Yeah, yeah. There's loads of locations, I suppose, when you think about it, the, the Dark Cave on Dagobah, that weird sort of place on Acto where Ray sort of gets drawn in. You know, and there's a similar looking place in the Acolyte where the witches have their coven the, the, or the shrieking around that thing, which was a similar sort of vibe. So there's definitely places in the galaxy that you think would be kind of spooky. But there are actually, when you think about it, are quite a few places that would feel very dark. So the crashed second Death Star on Kef Beer. I mean, mm. Ray literally comes across a, a, like an evil version of herself. Yeah. In that room that's sort of adjacent to the Emperor's throne room. Go back to those early Marvel comics. You know, the, I know Alan Moore's in the news at the moment. He wrote some Marvel short stories for the Marvel UK stuff back in the early 80s. And some of them are really kind of creepy and, you know, weird sort of horror type stuff. As much as you think Sith would be obviously creepy, I think there's a weird, there's always weird that the old Jedi stuff feels even creepier. To be fair, Star Wars Galaxies, I think they did a really good job of their, I can't remember what it's called, but basically it was their Mustafar expansion, which was around obviously when Revenge of the Sith came out. How they did the whole of Mustafar just felt creepy and weird. It's about time that we get another canonized version of Death Troopers. Something like that would be quite cool. Because that, what you know, that, those were meant to be kind of spooky, creepy books, really. I mean, they I did remember... a great job in Ahsoka, didn't they? They really did. I mean, we, I've just posted a piece at the site that uh, Hot Toys yeah. have released their Night Trooper, and they are so well done in that show. Precisely. I think it's about time that we get like a, a new novel for that, because I think that would be pretty cool. Keeping it in Galaxy, who would you dress up as? for halloween is there and is there a star wars equivalent of halloween obviously we get life day am i forgetting no you're not there sort of is i i wrote an article on stars.com years and years and years ago that mentioned or had in it images from i think it was the second uk ewok annual and in there was a short story with images and uh -huh. basically it was set on endor and they'd got sheets over their heads with the eyes cut out like ghosts and there were basically pumpkins everywhere. So I think on Endor, they must have something kind of equivalent to Halloween. And I think there are sort of equivalent holidays. I mean, you imagine in the Star Wars Galaxy, every day is a holiday because every planet's going to celebrate something. There would be that. But who would I dress up as? That's a great question. The women get the cool spooky characters, really, don't they? Because you, you can dress up as Mother Talzin or any of the Night Sisters, or you could be yeah. a size Ventress, which kind of has that Halloween -y vibe. If I was going to do it, I would probably be, I'd go into the comics and be the darker from the old Marvel run back in the day. 
Okay. Um, and try and figure a way to levitate. Maybe one of those ghost stands would help me. That would be kind of cool. And also in season one of Clone Wars, you saw like the zombie Gene Oceans that got yes. taken over by those, oh, those yeah. worm things. That would be cool. They were proper zombies. So something like that might be kind of cool. What about you? There's a part of me, because because I'm weird, would probably want to do, say, like a, a drag version of like a dead Padme. And actually saying that, that whole Geonosis, that arena and stuff, you know, when we do go back in, in Clone Wars and, and Rebels and stuff, felt very spooky. If we're saying we're setting this post ROTJ, then I think I'd probably actually want to do something like a Dead Emperor or something like that. I'd imagine that's probably yeah. quite a popular one. Or Vader, but I don't necessarily know how well known Vader is, like word of mouth. I still haven't quite got that idea if like your average person on your outer rim planet really knows who Darth Vader is. I still think at the end of Last Jedi, when the kids are playing in the barn and they seem to know the legend of Luke Skywalker, that that must be, it kind of happened instantly. How did the legend get out? That must be way later. When is Broom Boy doing his stuff? Is it happening then? Or is it happening way out in the future? I don't, I can't quite tell because how would the news get out about what happened on Crate? Shmi says it in Phantom Menace. Republic doesn't exist out here. So how did the news get to these places? It's myths and legends, isn't it? And that takes time to permeate any culture, let alone the galactic cultures. Although, I mean, if you look at it now, we've kind of a macro mirror to our own kind of world. It just needs to get onto social media. So you get something on like a, a get it on the holonet. And then suddenly you've got this whole fake news thing and, you know, what happens, <laughs> so. I mean, there's always this nice thing. I have to say, right, I always liked about A New Hope. I liked the fact that when you're watching New Hope up until um, the prequel trilogy came out, you. And the Clone Wars always felt like it was distant history. Really the equivalency of like us and the First World War, not even the Second World War. Again, with The Force Awakens, you kind of need that time. So by the time we get to Jakku, you kind of go, okay, I can understand maybe why Luke may have become kind of like this mythic legend. The speed in which it happens between Canto Bai and when they're on Kray, you know, unless of course the Resistance are putting it out intentionally, i.e. there's somebody hid behind a, a stack of crates who's filming a bloody thing. Like a, a resistance grunt just on his mobile phone, right? You know, on his data pad, just filming it, just streaming it like, you know, you do onto Facebook or something when you get pulled over by, like, the cops. And then that's it. It's, it only needs to be shared, like, ten times. I mean, the similar kind of thing as to how they managed to get so many darn ships to the Battle of Exegol. You put the call out on social media, and now and again, people rally to your cause and come and support you. It's not necessarily beyond the realms of impossibility but it's a bit of a stretch thank you shield fan 12 for that rather topical question if you want to send in an, a question between now and then be it about anything in the star wars universe galaxy or anything mr newbold could you let the wonderful listeners know how we can get in touch Yes, I can, and here's how you can do it. Email radio at fantatracks.com. Head to links.fantatracks.com for links to our social media feeds, Fantatracks TV and Fantatracks Radio. Thanks to James Semple for the Fantatracks intro, Blues Harvest for our making tracks opening music, and Mark Daniel and Vanessa Marshall for our voiceovers. New episodes drop Tuesdays and Fridays at 7 o'clock UK time. Our weekly news show, Good Morning Tatooine, goes live Sundays at 9 o'clock UK time on Facebook and YouTube. And remember, Fantatracks is absolutely free, so it costs nothing to stay updated on all the latest Star Wars news. And that's what you've done for this episode. Brilliant, my friend. Well, this has been a lot of fun. I'm sure you have as well, looking at that rather cheerful, smiley face on your webcam right there. So, thank you very much for listening, and everybody, we will catch you on the next episode of Making Tracks. So, until then, may the force be with you. Coming up next on Fantha Tracks Radio, it's Planet Leia. <laughs> <laughs>